Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. For some reason, I'm the, I seem to be the only one without a name tag, so I should introduce myself. I'm Paul Stairs, Director of the Center for Preventive Action here at the Council. And on behalf of the Council on Foreign Relations, I would like to formally welcome you to the Symposium on the Future of Conflict Prevention. Now, 10 years ago, almost to the day, the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict issued its final report. Three years in the making, it is widely seen as a landmark study. It represented a powerful plea for preventive action and a comprehensive, comprehensive set of recommendations for achieving that goal. And we're honored to have David Hamburg here who co-chaired the commission, and uh, we're very pleased, David, that you, you could make it today. The report also galvanized the whole field of conflict pr prevention and helped define the field, and I think uh, what has now become uh, conventional wisdom in terms of conflict prevention owes much of, of what the, the study laid out. Uh, in particular, that conflict prevention should not just be about last-ditch efforts to avert violence, that long-term, sustained, attention to states and regions at risk was critical to, to prevention, what they called structural prevention as distinct from near-term operational prevention. That conflict prevention should not just be about military and diplomatic uh, activities. A whole set of initiatives from development assistance to state building were also part of the, the menu or tool, toolbox of conflict prevention initiatives. I don't know, where, is this, can you? Maybe get closer. I'm very sorry. Um, thirdly, that uh, is that better? That seems to be better. Now I can hear the, the resonating. Thirdly, that conflict prevention cannot be accomplished by one state or one institution alone. It has to involve a coalition of partners harnessed to a common purpose. And finally, that, that conflict prevention cannot ultimately achieve its full uh, promise without it becoming ingrained in our thinking and behavior, what they called nurturing a uh, culture of, of uh, prevention. And this was absolutely critical to their findings. Now, I think the key findings and recommendations of the commission are no less uh, relevant today. The imperatives for preventive action are just as compelling. Indeed, they have arguably grown more acute. Now, while the incidence of armed conflict has declined in the 10 years since the release of the report, it is hard to take a lot of comfort from these statistics. The costs of armed conflict have been horrendously high over the last decade. Hundreds of thousands, if not more, have been killed and maimed. Millions have been displaced. Heinous atrocities and other crimes against humanity have been committed. Now, looking ahead, a quick survey of the world's hotspots are not exactly reassuring either. Quite the contrary, in fact. If we look at the situation in the Middle East, it is extremely fragile, despite recent progress in Iraq and at the recent Annapolis conference. Some would even characterize the situation as highly combustible. The situation is hardly better in Central and South Asia. <clears throat> the situation in, Af excuse me, in Afghanistan is deteriorating while the stability of Pakistan lies in the balance. In, outlook, in Africa, the outlook has improved for some, but worsened for others. The main peace treaties in the Congo and the Sudan, where much of the violence has taken place over the last decade, are barely holding up. Darfur continues to be an affront to humanity, while the situation in the Horn of Africa is seriously deteriorating as I speak. The same is true for Zimbabwe. And in Europe, we are hardly out of the woods either. Uh, as many of you know, today is the deadline for the report of the Troika, the US, EU, and Russia to the Secretary General about the situation in Kosovo. And uh, the situation in the weeks ahead could become particularly um, unstable there, if, if not for also for the, the Caucasus as well. And what about further into the future? There are many troubling questions that we must uh, grapple with. What effect will the likely proliferation of weapons of mass destruction have on international stability over the long term? The same goes for what are often called super-empowered individuals and non-state actors. What about the impact of global, global warming and resource scarcity that Vice President Al Gore so eloquently warned about this morning from Oslo after accepting the Nobel Peace Prize? 
And can we be so sure that the era of interstate conflict and great power rivalry is truly over, or coming to an end at least? Now, if we were sitting here 100 years ago, we would probably be comforting ourselves that major war was a thing of the past. Now, will we look back and also wonder what the hell we were thinking about uh, in years to come? Now, while we obviously cannot hope to address all these questions de today, we do want to stimulate a debate about whether the US and the international community is really up to the challenge of conflict prevention in the 21st century. We will begin first with a keynote address from, from the president of the International Peace Academy, Terry Rudd Larson. He will be followed by uh, two sessions, one looking back over what we have accomplished over the last 10 years and what we have learned, and the second looking uh, forward to the challenges and re requirements of the future. And we have a, uh, a terrific set of speakers here, and we're very privileged and thankful that they've made the effort to be here today. Finally, let me say that we hope to make these symposia an annual event. It's in many respects reviving a tradition that the Center for Preventive Action uh, had in the past, and we're very grateful for the Carnegie Corporation of New York for making it uh, uh, possible. Uh, before I hand over the podium to Richard Haas to introduce our keynote speaker today, I uh, just want to add, please turn off all your cell phones. Uh, this um, uh, proceedings are on the record. I have to uh, remind you of that, but in particular, please turn off your cell phones and other electronic appliances. Without further ado, I'll hand the floor to Richard. Thank you. Well, let me thank Paul and join in his welcome to all of you to the Council today and to this conference on the future of conflict prevention. Uh, the Center for Preventive Action uh, is an important component of this organization. In recent years, many people have come to recognize and appreciate better the link between conflict around the world and security at home. And clearly, conflict brings not simply horrible consequences for those caught up directly in fighting, but it also brings insecurity and the prospect of lawlessness and, and state failure, things which in turn lead to terrorism, human and drug trafficking, pandemic disease. And the, the work of this center is to identify and address the root causes of conflict. And central to what we're trying to do here at the Council, given our larger mission of promoting a better understanding in the world and of the foreign policy choices facing this and other governments. Let me say one or two things also, though, about the center and the people who have been and are associated with it. Today marks not simply the 10th anniversary of the publication of the landmark Carnegie Report, but also it marks uh, a transition here, the welcoming of Paul Stairs as our, our new director who arrived here at the Council just a few months ago, and thanking his predecessor, General Bill Nash, for his six years of service. Bill, well, stand up for a second. Let people, uh, let people see you here. During Bill's tenure at the helm of the center, it issued an impressive series of publications, 13 in all. He also directed an independent task force sponsored by the Council on post-conflict capabilities, and he co-authored a special report on the Balkans. More generally, he helped to establish conflict prevention as a topic of importance here at the Council and on the foreign policy agenda. The good news, though, is that Bill in addition to all that he's done, is staying with us here at the Council as an adjunct senior fellow for conflict prevention, and he'll continue to direct our military fellows program. Paul, who you've just heard speak, or at least after the first few minutes you heard him speak, uh, Paul comes to the Council from the U.S. Institute of Peace, where he was the vice president at the Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention. Therefore, he is well-schooled in what he is going to be working on here. He's got a strong background in the academic world and multiple think tanks. He led a working group on the uh, environment for the, uh, that formed the backdrop to the Iraq study group. And having him here, I'm sure, uh, will lead to this center uh, building upon what Bill began. And essentially, when we have a 20th anniversary uh, meeting, there'll be that much more to look at. Let me just, if I may, delay things just a few more minutes. I apologize for going on so long and say something about two other people. One is General Jack Vesey. Uh, Jack has been the chairman of the Center's Advisory Committee. He's been a longtime member of this council. 
He has been someone who has given the lion's share of his life to, to public service uh, in and out of, of uniform. It's interesting that it's someone who has his background, someone who wore the uniform in the United States military for all those years, who is probably the most eloquent and committed person I know on conflict prevention. And for those of you who think that's an irony or a contradiction, trust me, it's not. In my experience in government, it's precisely people in uniform who often are the most ardent when it comes to conflict prevention, if only because they are the ones who have to deal with failures in conflict prevention. Jack couldn't be with us today, uh, but asked me to convey his, his good wishes and respects to one and all. Jack couldn't make it, but I am particularly glad, though, to see Patrick Byrne here today. Patrick's another long-term council member, and he and his family have provided invaluable support to the Center for Preventive Action, in particular, by helping to establish the chair named after John W. Vesey, uh, and the current chair now, and the chair is currently held by none other than Paul Stairs. Let me also thank the Carnegie Corporation for its past and present support, uh, Bartan Gregorian, and also we're thrilled, and I'm thrilled, that David Hamburg is here today and will be with us on the, uh, the first panel. Uh, it's a great event, as Paul said, looking backwards, uh, looking ahead, and it seems to me entirely right for where we are because, alas, there's no shortage of material for this subject. Uh, our keynote sp speaker, is Terry A. Road Larson. Terry is the fourth president of the IPA. For those of you who are wondering what that is, it's not simply an independent form of beer served at many pubs in uh, Britain. It is the International Peace Academy. And he serves uh, also as the Secretary General Special Envoy for the implementation of Security Council Resolution 1559, which obviously deals with the situation in Lebanon. Uh, Personally and professionally, I, I find it hard to imagine a better person to be with us today. Uh, Terry is one of the wise men of our time. And he is, I believe, one of the wise men about the part of the world that, alas, provides the most material for conflict prevention, which is the Middle East. He is a director of an institute that, uh, in the early 90s, he was director of an institute that studied the, what was going on in the Palestinian, ter Palestinian territories. He played a central role at fostering the negotiations that uh, ultimately brought the Israelis and the PLO uh, together across the table rather than across a battlefield. And it led, as you all know, to the Oslo Accords just over, what, nearly a decade and a half ago now, just under a decade and a half ago now. Since then, he's held important posts in the Norwegian government and at the UN, largely, again, focused on the, on the Middle East. And now, as I said, he is the head of what I think is one of the uh, most thoughtful and important uh, institutes that, that's involved in this world. That, In some ways, I think the IPA performs a, a unique bridging role between the work of international organizations, in particular the UN, and the intellectual world. And again, it's, it's hard for me to find a better person to, uh, to, to oversee this hybrid than a person who, if you will, is a walking, talking hybrid himself. Uh, what we're going to do today is Cherry is going to speak from here for, what, 10 or 15 minutes uh, about the larger subject. Then he is going to uh, have to submit to some of my questions for a uh, few minutes. We'll do that from up there. And then uh, we will have a larger conversation involving you all. Mr. Rod Larson. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for those uh, two nice words. Um, it's a pleasure being with you, and a good afternoon to everybody. I use 10 minutes to um, talk a little bit about my perspective based on working particularly in the Middle East um, with peace building and peacemaking, and also being responsible for peacekeeping operations uh, for a number of years. Um, and my thesis is basically that there, the search for a grand theory of conflict prevention is in vain that the best we can do is to define tools to be used to establish a toolbox, which then has to be adapted very carefully to a very detailed analysis of the political context that we are working in. And here Richard's um, invention, uh, ripeness of the conflict is key. And so what I'll do with you is to share with you my thoughts about uh, the, the situation in the Middle East and what challenges uh, it poses for, um, uh, for, for um, conflict prevention. 
If we go back over the last um, uh, many decades, uh, there was one conflict which defined all the sub-conflicts of the Middle East. There was the, uh, the center of gravity for everything that was the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict. My thesis is that this center of gravity doesn't exist anymore, rather that there are four independent epicenters of conflict, each with its independent uh, dynamic, and has to be understood uh, first as independent conflicts, but also that these are getting more and more intertwined. And the four are, of course, the Iraqi issues, the Iranian issues, the Palestinian-Israeli issues, and the Syrian-Iranian-Lebanese issues. <coughs> if we look at Iraq, of course, that conflict has nothing with the Arab-Israeli conflict to do. It has a dynamic of its own, um, and it's, it's integrated in uh, the uh, regional dynamics, uh, regardless of the um, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. If we look at the Iranian issues today, they're also independent from the Arab-Israeli conflict, and they're, they're basically threefold. First is, of course, the uh, perception, still after the, uh, the uh, US intelligence assessment, uh, the, uh, the perception, particularly amongst uh, key Arab players in the region, that indeed they are pursuing uh, a nuclear um, capability. This might be wrong, but the fact is that the perception is there, and it's the perception who drives action. And then, secondly, since this is the perception, the, uh, <coughs> um, uh, um, this perception, in my opinion, will lead to a collapse of the NPT, the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, because there's no doubt in my mind that uh, other countries in the region will indeed pursue the same goals, which will lead to a de facto collapse of the NPT, uh, with enormous consequences for um, global peace and security. And then thirdly, which is uh, not less important, there is also um, a very strong perception amongst the key Arab Sunni leaders that Iran, and I'm saying this perception might be right, it might be wrong, uh, has uh, aspirations of uh, hegemony and dominance uh, in the region. And for many of them, this has now become the dominant, the uh, dominant conflict. As one Arab leader put, uh, said to me the other day, uh, I've come to realize I've been fighting as the, against the Israelis all my life, but I've, I've come to realize that this is actually just a real estate dispute. And I'm saying this to illustrate how the perceptions of the geopolitical landscape in the region has changed so fundamentally. And for, if we, we move our eyes to, uh, to Lebanon, for the uh, government coalition in, um, in, in Lebanon, their main struggle now, it was they perceived as um, aspirations of hegemony and dominance, partly from, from Iran, but particularly from Syria. Rightly or wrongly, but it's very strongly the perception. So the reason why I use a bit of time to this is to basically say that our, the whole geopolitical landscape of the region has changed fundamentally. And this is why, and it's incredibly important for us who are analysts and policy makers to realize this change because it means that you have to use different tools uh, in order to, uh, to, um, to uh, address the, uh, the, uh, the uh, issues. Many would also say that uh, all these th four epicenters of conflict in the Middle East, that they are getting more and more um, intertwined. And that indeed there is, with the perception of many Arab leaders, and maybe many as an understatement, um, is that there is a new center of gravity in the Middle East, namely Iran, which has, as uh, one head of state, um, said at an occasion here in, uh, in New York not too long ago, that it's perceived as, uh, as an octopus which has its tentacles into every sub-conflict of, uh, of the region. I'm not saying that this necessarily is correct, again, but it is a perception, and it's an articulated perception. This makes it, if indeed true, and also the very perception of these that, that dynamics makes it probably more difficult now to resolve any of these conflicts than at any time before in the, in the history of the conflicts, because they're intertwined. Because if you look coolly at this, it is very hard to resolve one of these epicenters of conflict without resolving all of them. And this is the kind of magnitude of the challenge now. I do believe, for instance, I, I worked with, uh, as, uh, as Richard mentioned, with, um, with uh, uh, Oslo in 92 and 93. Uh, I do not think that Oslo would have been possible today because the conflicts are so intertwined. There has to be a, they have to be addressed, um, uh, addressed in, um, uh, in parallel. But when this is said, and let me then uh, um, say a few words that, uh, about the kind of 
tools which had been used in the, in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I mean, Madrid was the kind of first major attempt to do it. In my opinion, Madrid was a very important event, but it was only an event because the process, and I was a part of it, failed completely. It didn't deliver anything. And then Oslo came in as an alternative because what um, Madrid was it, was, it was overt diplomacy, and it brought in, as you may recall, a particular set of actors, which was the Palestinian uh, Jordanian delegation, where people who were associated to or members of the PLO or Fatah were banned from being in the talks, which was a major mistake because it was impossible to make a deal without bringing the um, uh, leadership of um, PLO with Arafat in Tunis on board because they had blocking power on anything and it was kind of completely beyond them to allow their de facto representatives uh, from Jerusalem and Gaza to make a deal because it would mean the end of the PLO. And this is what we saw in, in, in Oslo. You can't make a deal without going to Tunis, and this is precisely what we did. What we also saw was that the Madrid process, as it um, played out in, uh, in Washington, turned it into a kind of rolling press conference where the Israelis were speaking to their electorate and the Palestinians were speaking to the Arab street, and they were speaking less and less to each other. So what we did was the opposite. We made very small delegations. There were only three, three uh, th maximum four on each side, and usually only three. And we insisted it should be the same people, that they should not stay at different hotels as they did in, in Washington, basically live together and go through a period of, and this is the tool again, of pre-negotiations, where the only goal is to create personal confidence and to try to be helpful in producing um, uh, a belief that, at, that there is some kind of a way to go about it, and which became the idea of the Declaration of, of Principles, a completely different way of working, two different architectures uh, of, a, uh, of a process. Oslo, of course, um, was not the peace agreement. It was the first roadmap, because what it actually does is just designing a road towards a possible a peace, saying it should take five years, I was taking 15, to, uh, to, uh, to reach the end goal. And the end goal wasn't defined in there because they couldn't agree on the notion of a Palestinian state. So then um, both Rabin, Peres, <coughs> and Bibi Netanyahu actually followed the gradualism of Oslo. Ehud Barak, when he was prime minister, broke very radically with this whole approach. He left the gradualism and approached something which might be called totalism. And I remember I, I came to him the day after um, he won the election that year and, uh, to his house and I asked him, so Edward, what are you going to do? So he laughed and he looked at me and said, I will do it exactly opposite of what your Oslo guys did. And then he used a kind of funny metaphor. He said, you see, because what we have in front of us is an ugly dog. And then you have to analyze it and you have to find out why is it ugly. And what we see is that, is that it's ugly because it has an ugly tail. So what do you do then, he said. Of course, we chop off the tail and we beautify the dog. But he said, but not like a salami, like you Oslo guys did it. We have to do it in one chop. I would make peace with Lebanon, Syria, and the Palestinians, an end of, an end of conflict in one go. Admirable. And I agreed. But it failed miserably and led to seven years of violence. And this is a very important point and highly relevant to the process which is ongoing now, the Annapolis uh, process. That is that when you start a process like this, it's very risky because if you fail, you do, do not go back to status quo ante. You make it a lot worse because what you are, are, are doing is making a competition saying, we believe the negotiating table can resolve the conflict. And then the other guys, they're saying it's only, which would be Hamas in, uh, in, in Gaza, were saying, no, it's only resistance, as they would put it, the barrel of a gun, which can do it. So if you fail with the negotiating table, then the, alter the alternative for many will again be the barrel of a gun. And this was precisely what happened after Camp David. So uh, I think it was Karl Marx who said that history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as comedy. Um, but this is risky business, and it's very, very, very serious business. And this is, uh, this is also, I think, in many peace processes um, around the globe, there is very little institutional memory uh, of which tools are effective in which kind um, of, uh, of situations. Ariel Sharon chose another strategy, which, w w uh, which he himself actually turned as um, unilateralism. He pulled out of Gaza 
without negotiations. In my opinion, admirable, but it was done the wrong way. The architecture of the process was wrong, because when you pull out unilaterally, then the guys with the guns can say, you see, the guns work, because then you can't argue it was a negotiating table. So actually, this weakened Abu Mazen and his allies and strengthened Hamas, and in my opinion, um, paved the way for their um, de facto coup d'etat uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Gaza. Again, the tools. You have to have an eye for the landscape to understand when it's ripe and when it's not ripe, and you have to, to use the, the, wrong to, uh, the right tools. And if you, use the, if you use the wrong tools, it goes bad. Uh, <coughs> uh, so again, shall it be done overt, shall it be done covert? Shall you start with a ceremony, Madrid, Annapolis, or shall you do it secretly and end with the ceremony, like uh, Clinton's uh, 13th, 13th of September uh, a ceremony at the, at the White House lawn with Yasser Arafat and um, Shimon Peres and Itzhak Rabin. These are completely different ways of doing things. But, uh, but what is pretty shocking to me is that it seems as if every new set of negotiators, they try to reinvent uh, the wheel once again and doing exactly the same mistakes, even if the history here is only 15 years. I think it will end on that note. Thank you. Well, thanks, Terry. Let me, you referred more than once to the toolbox. We, uh, we have an affirmative action program here at the council where we've tried to increase the number of carpenters uh, in our midst. Uh, what is in your toolbox? What do you think is in the, the conflict preventer's toolbox or needs to be? Uh, let me illustrate uh, by um, uh, maybe first the Israeli-Palestinian issues and then the uh, Syrian-Israeli uh, issues. Let's take Syria. Everybody is saying Israel and Syria should go to the table, and nearly everybody. I will ask the question, what is the agenda? And if you look today, the agenda uh, today has to be very different from when um, President Clinton was negotiating with Hafez al-Assad uh, and uh, Ehud Barak. Because Syria wants, and it's fair, they want to have one agenda uh, uh, item, the Golan. If you look at Israel, there isn't any Israeli government now who says, Hold on. Yes, it's okay with Golan, but we have to talk about Hezbollah. We have to talk about the blue line, the border uh, um, to, um, to um, uh, Lebanon. Uh, we have to talk about uh, all the Palestinian so-called rejectionist groups, Hamas, Jihad, PFP, DC, etc., etc., who are headquartered in Damascus and strongly supported by the government of Syria, and some of them funded with uh, money from another neighboring country. And we also have to chip in um, uh, uh, allegations that insurgents in um, Iraq are coming in from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Syrian territory. And if you look at that agenda, I would say, to resolve all those issues today through negotiations, impossible. So I would say that, I mean, these talks will not bring, uh, the chances for these talks to bring about the resolution are extremely small. But if you start negotiations and it collapses, it might pave, pave the way, worst case for a war. So I'm, I'm basically saying you have to be extremely careful about the tools and how you design the process. Well, let's talk about one now. I mean, you've used the Middle East as an example. Uh, one of the analyses that a lot of people have been put forward, uh, truth and packaging including me, is the Palestinians now are too weak to make a peace that... Um, with the Hamas and sitting in Gaza and so forth. So what about, might not one of the tools in your kit bag be military and economic aid to Abu Mazen to strengthen his hand so he can control the Palestinian territories better and have the confidence that he can survive compromise? Couldn't the diplomat's kit bag here, if you will, include a lot of guns and a lot of dollars? Yeah, I, th I would actually, um I would support such an approach. But even if this is done, I think the chances for within 2008, within the time frame of uh, the current US administration, to make a deal on all the final status issues is, is very unlikely. So, and then I think there are, there are kind of three alternatives here. Uh, one is, and it has to be done on a parallel basis of what you suggest, is that you, the minimum which might be possible would be 
um, a package of evacuation of settlements and a compensation package for the settlers, because that would create completely new uh, dynamics there. But I doubt very much that this is enough for Abu Mazen to survive politically in the West Bank. And then the extreme here is, of course, a final status deal, which is the goal of Annapolis. Uh, but it's not only so that um, the uh, current uh, ruling coalition in, uh, in, in the West Bank is not particularly strong, but it's also so that what Abu, Abu Mazen needs, can this be delivered by the current uh, uh, cabinet in Israel? I doubt it, that you can get a consensus in that cabinet around a final status deal. Can it be carried in the Knesset? In my opinion, no way. Which means that you have to, to have new elections, which probably is the way it will go, indeed. But this cannot be done within the time frame we are talking about. Right. And, and this is why don't create expectations which are dashed, because that creates new violence. So play expectations down, try to do it. And this is why my opinion is that a deal here can only be reached through negotiators uh, who, who have the same goal and who, and who does it secretly. Because public uh, negotiations will not work here, because both parties will have to posture. And of course, this is why, in substance, the declaration from uh, Annapolis is very weak. It's only process-oriented. This is why, I mean, none, of them, I mean not, none of them could give away anything. In but doesn't that contradict your point? One of, my, one of the criticisms of Annapolis was just that, that the joint document, the joint understanding was just process. And in particular, it didn't give Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, any argument to take home to the Palestinian people about why they should reject violence and, and embrace negotiations. One of the things, uh, I, I, what, I, what I thought you were going to say is that you need to say in public and arrange things in public so then people in private are prepared to compromise. One of the critiques I would make of Annapolis is the United States didn't do that. I would say the same mistake was made at Camp David that the Carter administration arguably didn't give Arafat the, the public protective shell he needed. I'm not sure he would have taken advantage of it anyhow. But uh, you need to have a public dimension so private diplomacy can, can prosper. What, how does that sound? I have pretty radical views on this. I'm, I would have done Annapolis at the end of a process, not at the beginning of a process, because then you create expectations which are not very likely will be met. So I would have gone straight into secret negotiations or semi-secret, maybe have one public and uh, one secret, but the real one is the secret, and then ended up with a spectacular ceremony. Because there's no way the parties are willing to give away what they have to give away at the beginning of the process. They will not, they will not play their cards. This is a souk. I mean, they will not play their cards before the, before the deal is there. You will never have the Palestinians to renounce the right of return or find some compromise there before at the very end of the day. What, when, would have happened if pre what would have happened if President Bush had done what the two of them were unable or unwilling to do? What, I mean, it really gets at the role of outsiders. If you're right that at the beginning of a process you can't expect the protagonists to make their compromises and declare all that they're prepared to, to settle for, What's wrong with having outsiders do that to, to create a, uh, a context for them to go do their work in? No, I think, um, I mean, when Annapolis was first announced, it was something very different from what actually happened because there was created expectations that there would be a deal at Annapolis, which of course was impossible. And then the, the expectations were lowered to what was realistic, namely to start a process. But you don't need a ceremony to start a process. Okay. Uh, because then you build the expectations again. And look, I mean, it's 12 months, maybe less, to do it. Uh, and then you have to have elections in Israel, you have to have a referendum in the West Bank on it, for sure. I mean, this, this takes time to organize. So the chances are very slim, though there is one good thing which, which came out of, uh, of Annapolis and the process which is going on now, that is that a, a process in itself is containment and is holding back uh, violence. So uh, uh, there is a plus here. But there are lots of minuses. Um, so this is, and again, it's the toolbox. You have to be extremely careful for what tools you choose, and timing is everything. Let me ask you a couple more questions, then I'll stop. Uh, obviously, you believe in diplomacy. You're a, a diplomat by, by training. So should Hamas have been in Annapolis? Should you have all the parties to a dispute there? Uh, this is a completely theoretical question, because given the coup d'etat in uh, Gaza, uh, 
I mean, Abu Mazen and the Palestinians would never have accepted to have them there. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, if the president of France was uh, kicked out of Paris by his, uh, by his prime minister and uh, had to, uh, to uh, live in uh, Lyon, Let me ask uh, question and then ask him to go to the same meeting with the guy who's sitting in the Alice Palace, I mean, come on, it's, uh, Let me so ask this is question. totally unrealistic. Uh, it's kind of per se good, but it uh, has nothing with uh, the world of realities to do. Let's ask the question a different way. Uh, <laughs> should there now be... <laughs> I, sh I should, yeah. I spent several years <laughs> talking to people who uh, essentially represented the IRA. So I, I have some familiarity with this uh, dilemma, uh, which is... Um, it gets really, actually, I'll ask the question this way. It gets at the whole question of preconditions. As a diplomat, do you believe that there should be preconditions set before you are willing to talk to a party, be it Hamas in the case of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, Iran in the case of the U.S.-Iranian bilateral relationship where the United States has announced it will not entertain bilateral dialogue until such a time as the, Iraqi, as the Iranians first suspend uh, uranium enrichment. In principle, do you believe that preconditions are a should they be part of your toolbox? Yeah, let me put it this way. Preconditions should be n negotiated in pre-negotiations. And I actually mentioned one um, <laughs> example here, and that is the agenda for Syria-Israel uh, talks. This has to be, uh, you have to, to agree on the agenda first. Because if you can't agree on the agenda, such talks are doomed. And you can only do that in pre-negotiations, uh, maybe through go-betweens. Uh, and as far as I understand, there's been a bit of a process here. Uh, and the, the conclusions are not very encouraging. I should have pre-negotiated this conversation. Uh, <laughs> you're tough. You're tough. Uh, let me ask you like a, one word that has conspicuously not emerged from the today is one that if uh, I had been sitting next to the 43rd president of the United States would have emerged quite often, which is the word democracy. Uh, how important is it that the protagonists be Democrats, small d, in the sense of uh, be committed to democracy, be part of a democratic political culture. Does that see, do you see that as necessary, desirable, irrelevant, counterproductive? I'm curious whether, how, how you view that. I mean, if you set up uh, rigid Western-style um, criteria for, for democracy, I mean, there's not hardly anybody you could speak to in that region. So if you want to speak, you have to accept that, I mean, all these guys are not necessarily good guys, uh, but you have to speak to them. But what I'm saying is that the question is not to speak to them, but how you speak to them. And if you, if you design the speaking in a wrong way, it will go bad. If you do it in, a, in the right way, then the design uh, will um, uh, determine the outcome. And this is why I'm, uh, I think Madrid and Oslo are very good examples of this. I mean, uh, uh, Oslo was done as the exact opposite of Madrid, and it worked. And let me also add one thing here, and that is uh, uh, the kind of three buzzwords here. It's um, peacekeeping, uh, peacemaking, uh, and peace building. One of the reasons why the peace process has survived was actually that the Palestinian Authority was established as a part of the deal. Because if you don't build institu institutions, peace is not sustainable. And, um, and if there had been no, Pal no Palestinian authority, there wouldn't have been a, a Middle East peace process now. So, and this is, uh, this is a completely new chapter I'm opening up here now, but this is also um, uh, in incredibly important here. Because in a way, Oslo has um, survived as an ideology, the two-state solution which has conquered uh, the majority of opinions on both sides and conquered both the political elites of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Israel and the Palestinians. Look at it. Ariel Sharon actually went further than Isaac Rabin. Isaac Rabin never spoke about the Palestinian state, and he didn't want the Palestinian state. And I know it for a fact. Ariel Sharon radicalized Oslo by calling for a Palestinian state and a two-state solution. And this shows that the process is stronger than the personalities, but it has to be carried by institutions. Talking about, let, let's just, let me just ask the question in a slightly different way. The United States has put a great emphasis on the quality of Palestinian institutions. 
and so are certain voices in Israel. Indeed, there's an entire school of thought, including people like Natan Sharansky and others, and the people in the United States who agree with them that essentially believe so fervently in the concept uh, of the democratic peace that they essentially say that unless you have democracies as your counterparts, you shouldn't be uh, entering into uh, permanent peace arrangements, that you can't be uh, sure that non-democracies will, uh, will keep them, you can't be confident that non-democracies won't resort to, uh, to force. Well, what do you think of that? I mean, this is a kind of self-defeating uh, demand uh, because then you can hardly speak to anybody in that region. Um, well, we should more time if, for golf. If, if you set that up as a precondition, but you can operate it with it as a goal for what should come out of peace negotiations, but have it as a precondition, impossible. And this was precisely why uh, one of the reasons why Madrid and Washington failed, because. Um, uh, Arafat and, uh, and rightly so were defined as uh, uh, historically terrorists but I mean you couldn't make a deal unless you spoke to them you spent a lot of your life working at the UN uh, or, or at least recent years you have and you're now with the IPA which is is affiliated too strong of a word and, and we are an independent institution but we have a kind of mono focus on uh, on, on UN issues and issues on the UN agenda, basically the same agenda as the Security Council, reform of the UN, etc. So okay. we are kind of impacting think tank, but with uh, only one client, so to speak. So let me ask you then the question about, you clearly have a view that outsiders play an important role in many peace processes. What are the, um, when do you know whether to reach for the UN as opposed to some regional organization, as opposed to say the United States or somebody else acting alone? Is, do you have a, uh, a sense of criteria in your own head, a, a template that, that leads you to think on what occasions the UN is probably the right lead as opposed to the United States or somebody else? Yeah, I can give um, uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's very difficult for the UN to play uh, a central role simply because there is such a deep skepticism against the UN uh, in Israel and any Israeli government, whatever the Prime Minister must privately mean about it, had to take that into consideration. And this, we saw it exemplified last week <laughs> when uh, uh, the um, U.S. Uh, proposal to uh, endorse Annapolis in a, in, a UN, in, a, in a Security Council resolution was withdrawn from the table. I don't want to elaborate, but I think it illustrates the point. Um, but then there are instances where actually the U.N. in recent history have played a, uh, a, 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 the lead role and a very constructive role in very close cooperation with the U.S. And uh, since we have uh, Ambassador Nancy Soderberg here, here with us, uh, the, the U.S. and the U.N. worked, uh, she was the U.S. representative in the Security Council in the year 2000. And that was a, an incredibly tight and good co cooperation between um, the um, P5, particularly the, uh, the U.S. and France, uh, when the UN very successfully uh, negotiated uh, Israel's withdrawal from southern Lebanon and nobody else could take that role simply because it was only the UN who under international law could draw the line of withdrawal, the so-called blue line, because there's no nation who could do that. It's only the UN who has the legitimacy to do it. But we needed the support of the uh, basic players uh, internationally and the region and we got to it. I, I remember uh, maybe I shouldn't say this because I was a negotiator, but uh, 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 Kofi Annan, uh, I remember he told me, we will do this, but only if the P5 accept that we have the lead role and that the P5 are going to be our supporters for it, which was happily accepted by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by all of them. And Nancy did a great job in the council uh, at the time. So, and, and also, if I may add, then also Syria's withdrawal, military withdrawal from, uh, from Lebanon, the same. I also had the privilege of uh, overseeing uh, uh, those negotiations, and uh, uh, th there was nobody but the UN who, who could have done that. So there are instances where the UN is in a unique position, but there are also instances where it's extremely difficult for us to, uh, for us to, uh, to, to do things. And uh, I think the establishment of the quartet, potentially, is very good, because here you have US power, European money, and you have UN, UN legitimacy. But again, it's a tool which has to be used the right way. Okay, uh, let's open up the collective toolbox here. Uh, we have a tool called a microphone. So uh, if I'll recognize as many of you as I can, if you would uh, 
let us know who you are and where you're from. Keep your questions short. The ambassador uh, will uh, give some answers. Ambassador Pelletro. Uh, Bob Pelletro, American Academy of Diplomacy. Uh, Terry, what's your view of the role of NGOs in conflict uh, prevention? Uh, as sponsors of uh, track two discussions, as uh, developers of various projects that build confidence, where does NGO activity fit in your toolbox? Actually, they are very much at the center of my uh, toolbox because there are instances where NGOs, like re research institutes like the Council, like IPA, can do things which no government can do. And you can do it in cooperation with, a, with the government. And actually, Oslo is um, a case in point here because the Palestinians and the Israelis, when they started Oslo, it had to be completely secret and so secret that they did not want the government of Norway to facilitate it. They wanted a research institute to facilitate it because then there was deniability, because they could say it's only an academic exercise. So actually, the first drafts of the Oslo Agreement was written on a stationery of my previous research institute, FAFO, uh, so that they could have the deniability, saying, look, we were just at the seminar. Uh, so, so actually, all the, all the facilitation from A to Z was done by this NGO, but with the full support and knowledge, of course, uh, of the government, and the foreign minister, of course, was briefed on every detail. Um, so, uh, for instance, I can tell you, um, it was Foreign Minister Stoltenberg, who you know very well, who uh, was foreign minister for the first part of the, uh, the Oslo process, and then uh, Mr. Holst for the second part. Stoltenberg never met the negotiators on either side. Uh, so, um, uh, so, um, so it, I mean, there is, the, there is this niche uh, which is very, very, very important. I could give you other examples as well. That's cool. Sure. Tony, Tony Shays. We have a microphone coming your way. Tony Chase, Fletcher. Um, how could preventive deployment have worked better in Lebanon, and would it have been a good idea at the time the unfortunate deployment took place? That's a hard one. Um, <laughs> now, it's, uh, of course, there's so many issues um, uh, in, um, in Lebanon. The burning issue of the day is, of course, the presidential elections, which have been stalled. <laughs> Parliament is supposed to meet again on Tuesday to elect the president. Uh, hopefully, it will happen. Um, uh, and it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it, it's very tricky to, to intervene in such a process. There is a Security Council Resolution 1559, and I'm working as the, uh, the uh, Secretary General Special Envoy for his implementation, which calls for free and fair elections according to constitutional rules. But there is a fine line here, because this is also the uh, sovereign decisions of the parliament. So for the international community, even the UN, to intervene here is difficult. Um, what kind of historically has happened over the last few weeks, historically, is that the government of France has taken very much the lead uh, in a dialogue between the different parties and the key regional players uh, uh, on, these, uh, uh, on these issues. But it's, it's incredibly difficult because there's this, you have to, to tread on this very fine line. So I accompanied the Secretary General just a few weeks ago to Beirut where we spoke to, to all the key players, and it is really difficult because, and, it's, and here it's the democracy issue again, because if I may use half a minute on it, uh, um, it's um, because the constitution calls for a secret ballot where the president has to be elected by two thirds. But there is also a para saying that if this doesn't work, there can be a second ballot where there's only half plus one absolute majority. But what the government coalition, who has more than absolute majority, they are afraid that if they, if they indeed do take this step, that it will, then it will unleash a civil war. There is, also another, uh, there is also another para, para 74 in the Constitution that says that if the, the presidency is vacant, then Parliament has to meet and there's no requirement for a quorum. So anybody who shows up can elect. But politically, people are very, re very resistant to do it because it might lead to new violence. So here there's very narrow room of maneuvering for the international community or for diplomacy at all. Uh, and it's a fragile um, balance here. And, um, but everybody knows, of course, that several of the key regional players are, um, 
very heavy, to say, to, to put it, uh, understated, into this process, but it has to be uh, addressed in it with great delicacy. Mind if I add one or two things? I'm just on preventive deployments. I just say two things. One is there's an interesting debate going on about Kosovo now, whether we ought to plus up, if you will, the existing quasi-preventive deployment to make sure that it's a successful preventive uh, deployment. The other situation that comes to mind is not so much a preventive deployment, but I think it makes the larger case that either you need to keep a peaceful situation peaceful or make a non-peaceful situation peaceful if you're going to succeed. And the British Army took them more than a decade in Northern Ireland. And you basically had to persuade people there that they could not shoot their way to their political goals. And only when they became persuaded, I believe, that on one hand they had a political route, and two, they could not succeed through the military route, did you essentially have the preconditions of a successful negotiation. So I'm a great fan of preventive or trans-conflict deployments. The problem is, uh, it's often, as you know better than I do, it's just often hard to mount them. Uh, the biggest problem seems to me is one of will and capacity, not the idea. I think the idea is a pretty strong one. It's just hard to do it. We got a fruit. Good morning. I'll try to get to everybody. Yeah, it's a way for the microphone, sure. Yeah, Farooq Kathwari from uh, for today Refugees International. You mentioned about this perception among the Arabs about uh, Iran. How much uh, do you think that perception is within the ruling classes and how much of it is within the general populations? Short answer, very much in the ruling classes and very little in the general population. Which has real consequences. Of because course. if the United States were ever to, the same governments that are urging the United States on many occasions to use force would then have to deal with the consequences from below. And some of them, I think, might want to be careful what they wish for. But uh, that would be my last intervention. I don't want to abuse it. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Giuseppina Zara from the Permanent Mission of Italy to the United Nations. Um, I have two questions in which... Can you pick up one? Because we got lots Sorry? Of, just keep one question because we got lots of people who want to okay, ask questions. Okay, just one. Uh, Lebanon, of course, in which my country has uh, a keen interest in it. Uh, how, do you think that the, per the perspective of two governments is a realistic one, or uh, do you think that the convergence of one name that, is, uh, that came out in the press um, is going to be, um, you know, it's going to, to realize that. Uh, thank you. And I, I've learned that um, the only thing which is predictable in the Middle East is that everything is unpredictable, and I don't think it's possible to predict anything about it because the, uh, everything is kind of up in the air. There can be a president on Tuesday. If there is not, I mean, we will be on a very slippery slope. And it's, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's anybody who, are, who can have any. Uh, qualified opinions about where this will end, unfortunately. Alan? Thank you. Alan Hyman, Columbia Presbyterian. In 91 in Madrid, the leaders who represented were perceived to be strong leaders. In 93, in September on the White House lawn, the three leaders were also perceived to be very strong leaders for their own people. Now we all recognize there are no strong leaders anywhere. How does that affect negotiations? Terribly. <laughs> <laughs> Terribly was the answer. You want to say one or want to elaborate? Why? No, it's, uh, I, I, I kind of touched upon it when um, uh, when I talked about uh, what Abu Mazen needs. Abu Mazen needs very clearly now to demonstrate to his people that the negotiating table works better than a barrel of a gun, and that's quite a challenge. Which means that it's only a very good deal which can help him. Then, on the other side, you have Olmert um, and a, a very uh, mixed cabinet uh, where you have people who are, who are very resistant to have the establishment of the Palestinians, that they're resistant about splitting Jerusalem into two capitals, extremely resistant to any solution related to the, to, to the refugees. So I think, as I said earlier, I think he will have to, if, it's a, if the deal is a good deal for Abu Mazen, then I think uh, Olmert will have to take it to the people through elections. Uh, and which also means that when you have an administration which is outgoing, uh, and it would be any administration, not only this administration, but of course be much weaker because they just have 12 months to go. And there will also be a temptation, I'm telling you, amongst the parties to, to think the longer it goes, 
as our father did in, uh, during Camp David, why should I give this on a silver plate to an outgoing president? It would be much smarter to give it on a silver plate to an incoming president, because then, then I would have goodwill for four, maybe eight years to come. And the longer you move uh, into the uh, election cycle in the States, the more these temptations will come up amongst both of them. Sure. Shariar Azhar from Muslim Public Affairs Council. You quoted the uh, Arab diplomat saying he has been fighting um, for a real state. And actually, again, as you presented the conflicts, the four conflicts, it seems that the parties to the conflict are all in the Middle East. But missing from sort of all of that or the maybe the thread that combines the four is the commodity, oil. And that brings in a lot more participants to the conflict. Um, and can you really have um, a solution to all of these without really addressing that particular aspect of it? I think this is a very, very important uh, aspect. And this is actually one of the reasons why uh, the, uh, mid the Middle East conflicts are unique compared to all other con conflicts, whatever continent or region you are in. Because Say the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, it's a local conflict, but it's also a regional conflict because it's a domestic conflict in every Arab and every, and every Muslim country, and it, it has become also a domestic conflict in most European capitals because of the, the uh, new composition of the populations there. But it also touches upon religion, politics, and economics. And it's tempting to, uh, to, uh, to uh, quote a very senior person I, I met this summer in, uh, uh, in OSE, in uh, Vienna, uh, who looked at me, we were talking about these issues, and he said, you know, if a regional war breaks out in the Middle East, which is not unlikely, he said, Europe will be the second victim, and Gazprom will be the overlords of Europe, simply because all of Western Europe, with the exception of Norway and UK, will be completely de dependent on energy from Russia. So uh, I'm just illustrating a point, which means that, I mean, if there is a war in this region and it goes bad, then it will not only change the economics of the globe, it will change completely also the global power structures. And this is why, I mean, you have many conflicts in, in Africa which are very difficult, very dangerous, very fragile, but they don't have impacts like this. And this is why, this is the uniqueness of the Middle East uh, conflicts, and this is why it's so imperative to resolve them. My own opinion, if I might volunteer, is that, but this has to be long term, that for the Middle East, uh, you do not have a regional organization in the Middle East. You have the GCC, you have the Arab League, but it doesn't encompass Israel, it doesn't encompass Iran. And unless you have an institutionalized security structure in that region, it will be uh, uh, on the brink all the time. But to establish this in the near future is impossible. Because you will never, um, it will be very difficult for, for many of the Arabs to have the Iranians on board in an organization and to have the Israelis and the Iranians on board. Is in, but, uh, but I mean, if, if you look at what is needed, this is what is needed. But it's a pie in the sky to do it tomorrow. But my, my opinion is that this must be the longer term goal. This is also the intertwining of the four, um, of the four conflicts. And they are completely intertwined also in the geopolitical global landscape. Rita Hauser. Thank you. Rita Hauser. Terry, I want to come back to a more tactical question with uh, the Lebanon, which we've talked about. The Security Council, under pressure from the U.S. after the Hariri assassination, adopted a Chapter 7 resolution calling for an investigation and a tribunal. The tribunal hasn't been established yet. The investigation is ongoing. The obvious aim was to find out, I assume, who in Syria was responsible for this. Assuming that one comes to that conclusion, how do you proceed from there? Or put another way, does the quest for justice sometimes done prematurely interfere with the peacemaking process? I have to tread very carefully here, firstly because Rita is my boss, she's my chairman. And then uh, sec on the secondly, this is a very tricky uh, issue also because there is a um, uh, there is a special investigator for the uh, murder of Hariri and I think uh, 16 or 18 other assassinations and uh, assassination attempts in Lebanon over the last three years, all against uh, politicians, journalists, and tra trade union leaders who were staunchly anti-Syrian. 
Uh, and of course, this is an extremely sensitive subject. Mr. Brown has delivered his last re report to the council actually last week. Um, but um, he has chosen not to reveal what kind of findings he has to the Security Council because he says the right address for that is the International Tribunal, who will be established very shortly. Uh, and then they have to assess the evidence uh, which is there and then um, uh, take the necessary, the, the necessary uh, steps. Um, I am not privy to the details uh, of what Mr. Brummers has amassed of, uh, of, uh, of evidence, and if I had it, I couldn't um, talk about it publicly. So, uh, but this is of course a very, very uh, sensitive issue, and indeed there is a debate precisely related to your, to your question there, which is the collision between our, sometimes between uh, the quest for justice uh, and the, the uh, quest for um, um, uh, preventing deadly conflict. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a strange paradox, and uh, um, there are also some recent cases in, uh, in Africa uh, have very similar, uh, similar traits. And uh, of course, I can just say Libya and uh, Lockerbie. And uh, so this is a, this is a real dilemma. And as we move towards the conclusions being made public, I think this will become higher and higher on the agenda. But indeed, there are very hard choices to be made here. Where dilemma is overused. This is a place that is not overused. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it actually also has come up a lot in other the South Africa example. How how much should that be an example? And how much are, is justice after uh, the shooting stops? Is the pursuit of that, can it ease, if you will, solidify crisis or conflict prevention? And how much can it actually become a, a problem for it? Because it can keep certain wounds, shall we say, from healing. It's an interesting debate in uh, several, including it's going on in Northern Ireland now. It's an interesting uh, debate. We've got time for a, uh, a few more uh, questions, comments. Mr. Byrne. You uh, spoke of tools applied to detailed political analysis. I would have thought that Lebanon presented an ideal opportunity for that with the Dive Accord, because the Dive Accord calls for ultimately reforming the electoral law and the militias laying down their arms. And the U.S. has never really pushed hard for that. And could you comment on that approach as opposed to 1559? Um, actually, it's, uh, it's exactly the same, because the Dive Accord the very language in 1559 is taken, is actually taken directly from the language on the Taif Accord. So the Taif Accord calls for the um, disbanding and disarming of all Lebanese and non-Lebanese militias, this is verbatim, and it's exactly the same sentence in 1559. So, which has made it um, as a kind of interesting point, because when I started going to, uh, to Lebanon on behalf of the Secretary General to implement this, uh, this, this resolution, uh, they were basically saying, we don't want to speak about 1559, but we, but we can talk about Taif. And of course, I just said, I don't, I don't care what you call the baby. So if you call it Taif, it's fine with me. I can call it 1559, you can call it Taif. But, uh, and, and this is in a way the beauty of 1559. It is not an international uh, intervention because it's a complete replica of the demands which are in uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Taif agreement, uh, particularly related to the Syrian military withdrawal and also the, the language uh, concerning the um, uh, disbanding and disarming of, uh, of, of uh, militias. And of course you have the kind of language debates here, where Hezbollah is saying, we are not a militia, we are a resistance movement. Uh, so it's, um, but uh, um, they're, these two are completely intertwined, 1559 and Taif. You said something, Terry, when you were in your opening remarks where you talked about the lack of institutional memory and the tendency of policymakers to take approaches as if they had never been taken before. Uh, two questions. Do we need more of a, uh, what's the word, a museum of negotiation than we now have? And second of all, I just had a curiosity, what is your sense of the best way to train people in this? Is it to steep them in the details, say, of Lebanon and Israel and Palestinian politics, economics, culture, what have you? Or do you think there is something to be said for negotiation 101 that ought to become a staple for people uh, in your business? Yeah, I, my belief is that um, the best negotiators I have met are those who have a, a very good academic training because 
you have to be able to conceptualize when you negotiate and be innovative on the ways to design the process and also on the substantive issues. So you, you, there is a need for a very strong uh, academic training there. But on the other hand, um, you also need learning by doing. Uh, you, you can't learn this only by reading a book or listening to a, to a lecture. You have to do it. Um, and, um, and this is why, um, I mean, there is a toolbox here. Um, and um, the amazing thing is that, I mean, even very well equipped, uh, equipped foreign ministries, they don't seem to have archives because they, they keep uh, repeating the same mistakes and it's completely unnecessary because you could, could just go into the archive and see what worked and what didn't work. And amazingly, I mean, the same mistakes are, done, uh, are being done again and again. Of course, there are some foreign ministries who are uh, exceptions here, but not that many. <laughs> Just as an aside, I remember showing up my first day of work for the previous President Bush, and every file draw was empty at the National Security Council because everything had been carted off to presidential libraries. So you literally started off with a clean desk, shall we say, uh, without a manual for how to proceed. Mr. Sorensen, I, th I think I saw your right hand somewhat raised. Wait for the tell you got a microphone heading your way. Oh boy. I'm uh, Ted Sorensen and Paul Weiss. Following up on Richard's question, um, I want to ask not about Lebanon or Israel or Syria, but about the United States. I'm concerned about uh, what is almost a uh, cultural malady here. I'm not talking about any one political party, but about an infection that seems to have affected both political parties, in which uh, peace is for weaklings. The United Nations is uh, for the naive. Negotiations are soft, and uh, so on and on, which makes you a voice in the wilderness that makes uh, the International Peace Academy, a uh, lonely outpost, and so on. What can be done about that? To some extent, I think it's true in Israel as well, but that's a different question. No, I think um, the, the, the efforts which are being uh, done in what is now called the Annapolis process are, are actually admirable. Uh, but it would have been much better if it happened uh, six years ago, because then it would have been a real chance. But of course the cards were also very different at the time because then you had uh, a Prime Minister of Israel who was standing for unilateralism and not negotiations um, and um, you uh, did not have uh, Hamas controlling uh, uh, Gaza and a kind of clean uh, Abu Mazen sitting in the West Bank who's easy to talk to. So it's a kind of a little bit unfair criticism because the cards are completely different, different today. And in a way they, the geopolitical landscape today represents an opportunity for the Palestinian-Israeli uh, 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 conflict. But it is also very difficult because in the neighborhood you have bo not, not only peacemakers, you have also peace breakers because there's nothing in it for them. There will be a temptation to be spoilers. And you also have kind of conflict entrepreneurs in the region who thrives of keeping the, con the, the conflicts alive. And if there is a will to spoil, I think there is a capability to spoil. And this is why I'm saying the chances are maybe slim, particularly if you go for what is needed, the, 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 uh, the establishment of, uh, of, two, uh, of the Palestinian state, the two-state solution. And, uh, and uh, uh, um, it's very risky because if we fail this time, it might be the last time it's possible to attempt to establish a two-state solution. And then we, 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 we might go back to scratch again where it will be non-state or one state. And that will be a hopeless debate. And we will be stuck with it for decades. This is why there's so much at play here. So this is why um, I'm very conservative on this, because to take huge leaps here are enormously risky. You have twice, uh, at least to my count, been quite critical of uh, the Israeli unilateral withdrawal from Gaza. And I expect uh, a defender of it would say it wasn't their first choice, but it was their only choice because the alternative was staying. That if you had basically said we need to negotiate our way out of Gaza, we'd still be there. How, do you, how would you answer that? No, I think that's uh, completely wrong, frankly, because 
if, um, if uh, Ariel Sharon at the time had said, okay, I will sit with Abu Mazen because I understand that if this springs out of a deal, then I will strengthen his allies who do not believe in the use of force and I will weaken the other guys. Uh, and um, I, I think there was a complete disregard of the uh, dynamics in Palestinian society. And I think, so, so I mean, it's always a good thing to leave occupied land. But again, it's the architecture, it's the way you do it. So they did it the wrong way, which paved the way for, uh, for, for more violence and paved the way for um, uh, Hamas's power grab in, uh, in, uh, in, in Gaza. So it's a tragedy. We have time for one last one, sir, in the back. My name is Milt Lowenstein. Uh, you talked about learning by doing and most of the conversation has been about a very refractory situation in the Middle East where there's been a lot of doing and apparently very little learning. Yeah, when we talk about uh, conflict prevention or violence prevention, what do you think about starting in much easier cases, small places that uh, are fragile, uh, nobody cares much about, uh, addressing them and learning bit by bit in places that are not so difficult? I think, mo I mean, all kind of violent conflicts which I, I know about today, both intrastate and between states, are very difficult. But what makes, makes it, uh, and so all of them are very difficult to handle. But then you have to, uh, and the UN is basically involved in all of them in some way or other trying to resolve it, having peacekeepers, um, actually UN peacekeepers, I know the second largest army in the world besides, uh, besides the United States. It's huge. It's all over the place in Africa and everywhere, Haiti. But uh, what makes the Middle East so unique, and this is why I'm kind of hammering on the Middle East all the time, is that this is the only global conflict because if it goes bad there, if, you, if there is a regional war, that breaks out war between Syria and Lebanon and Iran and uh, neighboring states, etc. I mean, it has such devastating consequences for the whole globe. If it goes bad in Haiti, it's bad for Haiti, and maybe you will have lots of refugees in the United States, but it won't wreck the global economy. It won't touch the hearts and minds of everybody around the globe. So this is the uniqueness of it, and this is why it's so incredibly dangerous and why it's so important to give it attention politically and diplomatically. Uh, I want to thank uh, Thierry Rod Larson for two things. One is for what he does every day. This is someone who has uh, dedicated uh, more years of his life to trying to accomplish good but extraordinarily difficult things than almost anyone I know. And secondly, I want to thank him for the law for this afternoon. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you so much. Uh, it is my understanding we're going to have about a 10 or 15 minute break and then we are going to convene with our first panel here, here at approximately 2 o'clock. Thank you, sir. Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.